Vice President of the Gel at the Sedex Bowl, and we'd like to welcome you here this evening to what I think will be a very good program. Um, one of the things I really need to make sure everybody's aware is that we do this in partnership with the Teton County Library and the Library Foundation. Um, we could not do it without their, their help and support. Um, the old bills is passed, so I'm not going to make a big pitch to donate to the Library Foundation, but think about that for a year from now when old bills rolls around again, because uh, the Library Foundation the Library do wonderful things for this community. <laughs> Um, there are materials on the table outside for those who are interested in finding out more about a program, about the Geologist of Jackson Hole, possibly membership. And as I pretty much always say, you know, the, the Geologist of Jackson Hole is an organization that is really for anybody who's interested in the world around them, from the center of the earth to the ends of the universe, because we have programs that uh, address all of those things during the course of the year. Um, membership does bring some benefits. Uh, we have a monthly lunchtime program that is for members only. We have outcrop of the month outings uh, during the summertime. We're about done with those. Um, and we have uh, field trips. We, last one of those probably just occurred last week. Where's John Gussler there? John, John led a, a trip over to Soto <laughs> Falls, Soto Springs, to look at uh, the Agrium uh, phosphate mine. So, the, so anybody that's interested in upcoming program, and there's a great program later this month, next month, and then we take December off and we start up again in January. Um, I don't have the 2016 program out there yet, but you can look at the rest of uh, what's up for this year uh, on the table outside. Tonight, we are very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Art Snoke here from the University of Wyoming in Laramie. Um, Art has a bachelor's in geology from Franklin and Marshall. He has a, a PhD from Stanford University. His research statement um, informs me, and I will inform you, that he was raised in the midst of Appalachian geology of Baltimore, Maryland, and his interest in earth sciences was incited or inspired by a, a group of really great teachers at Franklin and Marshall College in Pennsylvania. At Stanford University in the late 60s, and the six, that's really important, he became interested in the evolution of continental margin geology in light of the then rapidly evolving plate tectonic paradigm. In other words, that's when you know, the theory of plate tectonics was going through its the trials of being accepted, which it is today. And Art was there um, to, you know, I was a little bit behind that. It was accepted by the time I got there, at least as far as I knew at the point. Um, before coming to the University of Wyoming in 1984, Art had 10 years at the University of South Carolina. He has been at the University of Wyoming ever since 1984. And his ongoing studies on the geology of Wyoming are certainly diverse. Uh, he's studying the evolution of Precambrian rocks in southeastern Wyoming, as well as Laramide Age fault systems in south central Wyoming. Uh, another major ongoing project concerns the evolution of ancient oceanic art complexes, so think like Japan, and associated rocks that are found today in the Klamath Mountains of California. Um, are you still teaching art? I mean, this is all no, I do. Right. I taught my last class in uh, early May. All right, so I don't know where it is now. I, I, he did teach a long list of classes. Um, he has a little more free time now and uh, less of a paycheck as a result, too. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there are a couple of things from you know, the, you know, the way Art um, led his career in terms of teaching that I think are important. And you know, he said that uh, he encouraged, encouraged all students to read the primary literature, in other words, to read the scientific journals instead of just the textbooks. And certainly that's something I think is outstanding and not everybody does or did. Um, field studies have always been a centerpiece of his research approach. And he always uh, encouraged and tried to include field work uh, in the, the courses that he taught at the University of Wyoming. 
And it was my great pleasure to go on a field trip with Art and some other faculty from the University of Wyoming here just uh, a month ago. Yeah, yes. it's a really great trip. So tonight, Art is going to give you a tour of just about four billion years worth of history, geologic history, that you can see if you drive around Wyoming. And there's probably nobody better uh, than Art to, to give you this tour. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to Art Snow. Let me check to see if uh, this is about right as far as uh, volume. Everybody can hear me? Okay, okay first I want to thank John for that very nice introduction. Um, so when I uh, decided to um, give a talk on the geologic history of Wyoming going four billion years, um, I started thinking about it and working it through, and I realized that um, I teach a class, or I did teach a class on geology of Wyoming, and it was a whole semester. <laughs> and so I had to speak uh, very fast, uh, lightning speed, or I would have to generalize things. And so what I decided to do is, is generalize uh, my comments with the hope that during the uh, Q&A session, if there's things that uh, you'd like to know more about, I can, I can certainly do that. And, um, and, uh, but everything I'm going to talk about is, is, there's a complex story to it. Okay, um, it's a general map of, of Wyoming, and one of the, the most obvious and fundamental structural belts that, that goes through Wyoming are a series of basement-involved uh, uplifts, and the basement rocks here are Precambrian rocks, some are the oldest, are oldest rocks, and they're shown here in, in dark brown. And here's the Laramie Range here, here's the Bighorns, uh, the dirt juice up there, Wind River Range there. These um, uplifts provide a, a fantastic uh, chance to look at uh, some of the oldest rocks, well, the oldest rocks in Wyoming, but some of the oldest rocks in North America. And they're beautifully exposed. And of course, the Teton Range is one example where we have fantastic exposures of these, of these ancient rocks. So in this diagram, we're, we're looking at uh, the various uplifts, wind rivers here. And they're showing different kinds of rocks that, that make up um, this, uh, this province here, which is called the Wyoming province. And it consists of uh, Archean rocks. And basically, there's, there's four types of, of uh, Archean rocks that you find. One are some very old gneisses uh, that uh, go back some more than three billion years. Uh, they oftentimes have been through a very complicated history and they've been actually partially melted. Um, there's large granite bodies, like here in the Northern Laramie Range or the Granite Mountains here in uh, the Wind Rivers. And of course, there's some uh, in the, in the uh, Tetons and the Bighorns. And these are uh, large bodies. Uh, they. Uh, cover a large, we believe they cover a large area like this one here and this one probably connect. Of course, one of the things about having these uh, basement involved uplifts is that you have great exposures here, but then this is covered by younger rocks and so you have to make uh, some type of a correlation with uh, very little data in between here. Then uh, another type of rock that is, is found uh, in the Wyoming province, the Archean, are belts of what we call supercrustal rocks, which are rocks that were deposited on the surface of the earth. They were like volcanic or sedimentary rocks, and then they've been metamorphosed and buried. But they tell us a lot about some of the processes that were going on in the Archean. And I might emphasize, when I use the word Archean, I'm talking about rocks that are greater than 2.5 billion years old. So these are really ancient, ancient rocks. and. Um, and uh, they are really looking at the early history of the planet. Um, and then finally, uh, the, the fourth type of rock is uh, our ultramafic rocks. They're rocks that are, have iron and magnesium minerals. They're pretty dark rocks. And one of the great examples of it are the, the Stillwater complex in uh, the Beartooth, where we have uh, probably the best resources of platinum and palladium in the United States. 
Now, all of this that's in pink here and, and the colors is what's called the Wyoming province. And it's all greater than 2.5 billion. Now, in the south end of the Wyoming province, south end uh, is, a, is a large fault zone called the Cheyenne Belt. And the rocks south of there are younger. They're, they're what we call Paleoproterozoic. And they're, they're younger than about 1.79 uh, uh, billion. So they're considerably younger. And they were added on uh, at a later time. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a few minutes. So, so these rocks here form what we call the Wyoming Craton. And it's one of the, uh, all of North America, the core of North America, Laurentia it's called, is made up of various ones of these provinces that have been, been stitched together by uh, younger orogenic belts. Okay, let's take a look at some of these rocks. This is uh, some of the old Nisus, and I'll explain some of these words here because it's sort of a mouthful, Archean Nugatidae, Orthonice. Orthonice means that this rock once was a granite. And subsequently, it's been metamorphosed. And migmatitic refers to the fact that it's sort of a mixed rock. It has, has granite veins and segregations here, along with these dark rocks. So this is a, an old uh, uh, granite, probably a, I, I don't know the exact age on this particular one, but probably about 2.8 or 2.9 uh, billion years ago. And then it's been subject to uh, high pressures and high temperatures, and it's been melted. Here's a, out in the Granite Mountains. Um, these are these uh, granite complexes that go on for a long time, a long way. Uh, they're uh, massive. Uh, sometimes they have joints in them, various things like this. Uh, but they form large uh, intrusive masses uh, into the uh, supercrustal rocks that I mentioned. This is a, the granite that uh, is on Laramie Peak, and it's a typical uh, Archean granite. It consists of pink alkali fel or potassium felspars, uh, white plagioclase, black biotites, and uh, sort of glassy gray quartz. So this is a typical example of one of the Archean granites, um, and it's not it's usually not deformed and rather massive in character and very uniform um, uh, throughout the outcrop. Now, the supercrustal rocks, these ones that were deposited at the surface of the Earth and then have been metamorphosed, I find particularly interesting because they, you can use, uh, they have relic features in them. This was a, a basalt flow that uh, was extruded into a, a marine environment and uh, it crystallized uh, in the form of what we call pillows. It's a pillow of basalt lavas. In three dimension, in two dimensions, they look like pillows. In three dimensions, they're very tubular, and it's sort of you can imagine like you put your fingers together. Yeah, you would have these sort of tubes of of the salt, and then if you cut it, cut it across, you would see the pillows. And um, these are are used. They sometimes we can tell um, Strager at top with the pillows. I won't try to convince you, but. There may be, in, in this particular example, you may actually have a little bit of a cusp here to suggest some stratigraphic top is that way. I'm going to just take a drink of water if you don't mind. Okay, that'll keep you going for a while. Uh, This is another one of the supercrustal rocks. It's, um, it's a volcanic rock. Um, it's called a fragmental volcanic rock. And it consists of a class, um, which we refer to as Lapilli. Right here, these class are uh, you know, all scattered through this rock. And it's in a, a fine grained matrix, uh, which is called tuff. And so this is an example of a, a rock that was explosively <laughs> erupted. Uh, it's interbedded with some uh, sandstones, marine sandstones. Probably the, the eruption happened um, underwater. So the point of all this is that these supercrustal rocks, uh, which are deposited at the surface of Earth, tell us a lot about some processes that are going on 
And these rocks that I just showed you dated 2.7 billion years old. That's, I find that pretty neat. Um, okay, let's move on. Then finally, the, the, the last rock type in the Archean um, are these ultramagic rocks. They're, they're dark rocks, they're heavy rocks. Uh, they're similar to rocks that are in the mantle. And so here we have a, one of these dark rocks called a peridotite, consists of algae and pyroxene, and it's intruded in, in this case, it's intruded in some of these old, old gneisses. This is a relatively small body. Some of them are much, much larger than this, but it's the one I had a good, good example of. Okay, I um, put together this chart um, actually a number of years ago from the, the class I teach for Geology Wyoming. And what I wanted to uh, do was try to get the, the geologic history of Wyoming, at least as far as sedimentation, magnetism, and deformation, on one sheet of paper. So what I had to do is use logarithmic paper. And so what happens is the large numbers down here are compressed while the, the smaller numbers, the younger ages, are spread out. Now that works pretty well in geology because we always know less about these older rocks. So I could put in quite a bit of material here, but uh, it's like up here I could put even more material. So it's a logarithmic scale here. So this is this is the difference between 3,000, 3, that's what it says there, 3,000 and 4,000 is a billion years. Up here, uh, it's, uh, let's see, what is, that's, that's 15 and, is that 15 and 5? 10 and 5, yeah, it's five, that's 5 million years. So that's why the scale is, is not equal along the logarithmic. So we've been talking about the Archean, uh, rocks that are greater than 2.5 billion. And, um, and um, the title of the talk, though, is nearly um, 4 billion years old. Now, where does the 4 billion come in there? Because I, I talked about the nicest were greater than 3 billion, but I haven't said anything that's close to 4 billion. Well, the 4 billion comes in with a, a mineral called zircon. It's a zirconium silicate. And geochronologists have looked at some of the metasedimentary rocks that are in the Wyoming province, and they've looked at these zircons, because the zircons are amazingly resistant to weathering in metamorphism. And they found in the cores of these zircons ages that are about 3.9, 3.8. What that tells us is that there was some crust in what we call the Wyoming province now of that age. We don't know, we haven't found uh, primary rocks of that age, but what we found is zircons that date that age. So that indicates a great antiquity for uh, at least the Wyoming province. And it doesn't mean that the older rocks uh, can't be found. They might be found, but it's just that, that now it's based on the zircons. Okay, um, so we developed the, the Wyoming uh, province, the Wyoming Craton. And what happened next? Well, what happened next was that it started to pull apart. It's uh, what we refer to as rifted. And along the southern margin of Laurentia, or along the southern margin of the Wyoming province, it broke away through normal faulting and, and drifted away. Now, where that piece of missing Wyoming province is, I don't know. Uh, maybe it was subducted. Maybe it's, it's stuck in some other craton like the Slave or Siberia. Uh, but uh, it's gone, and it left a, a rifted margin there. And deposited upon that rifted margin was a thick sedimentary sequence. It's called the, di uh, the Deep Lake uh, Group or uh, Living Creek Group. And it's about 10 kilometers thick. And so on this rifted margin was deposited this set of sedimentary rocks. Now here's a blow up of uh, southeastern Wyoming. Here's Cheyenne, here's Laramie. So here's this fault boundary that I was telling you about, the Cheyenne Belt. And before the Cheyenne Belt developed, there was a rifted margin. And these brown rocks here are these uh, 10 kilometers of, of sedimentary rocks, dominantly sedimentary rocks. There's a thin layer of basalt in there, but dominantly sedimentary rocks that were deposited along this rifted margin. Now, the Cheyenne Belt uh, goes off to the north, northeast, and there's some evidence out in these hills of, of, of it. But a lot of the Cheyenne Belt, all the Cheyenne Belt here in the Laramie Range was actually intruded 
by a younger uh, uh, ignis complex, which we'll talk about. So we can see it very well over here in the medicine bows and over here in the Sierra Madres. It goes to the west, probably someplace close to the Uinta Mountains, and it goes to the north, but then runs into this trans-Hudson origin. So uh, we have really good control on it right here, and we know it. Most of what we know about the Cheyenne Belt comes from either the uh, Medicine Bow Mountains or the Sierra Madre. Notice that here's a, here's a Laramie Range here, and here are the components. That it, it's a part of the Wyoming province. There's big granite bodies there, super crustal rocks. There's orthognise there. And you can't really see this very well, but there's some small ultramafic bodies there also. So those are the four components of the Archean uh, uh, province. Okay, I, I mentioned that there's 10 kilometers of section uh, that's deposited, it's a stratigraphic section that's deposited on the rifted margin of the Wyoming province. And um, there are many formations. It's, it's a complex stratigraphy. But what I thought I'd do is pull out a few of uh, the rocks that I, or units that I find particularly interesting. And one of them is in this headquarters formation, and it's this weird name, diamictite. What that means is a very, very poorly sorted conglomerate. And so there's big class in here and in a fine grained matrix. Now this rock has been interpreted uh, since the 20s as an ancient glacial deposit. And uh, these rocks are greater than 2 billion years old. So this, if, if true, and there's, I'll tell you some more evidence that supports that, uh, if true, uh, this would represent one of the oldest glaciations on, on Earth. There's similar rocks like this in Canada, uh, and they're about the same age. One of the big pieces of evidence that this is a uh, glacial deposit is there's actually large boulders, much bigger than this, uh, March boulders that have dropped into fine-grained sediments. And those are interpreted as drop stones that fell off an uh, iceberg. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's an interpretation, but it's, it's a regional, reasonable interpretation, and there's similar rocks uh, in, the, oh, in the Canadian Shield. Now, as you go up through the section, uh, you go through lots of uh, plastic rocks, sandstones, and siltstones. One of the uh, really dramatic rock units there is the Medicine Peak Quartzite. And um, it holds up, those that have been up into uh, the Snowy Range realize this is Medicine Peak right here. Uh, that the Snowy Range is held up by this quartzite. It's absolutely white quartzite, uh, has lots of cross bedding in it. There's probably marginal marine. Sometimes uh, it even can get green because it has a little bit of, of chrome uh, mineral in there called fuchsite. So it's a spectacular uh, unit, and it's obviously a major ridge former here. OK, let's make sure I press the right button here. Now, certainly one of the most interesting rocks in the uh, Libby Creek group are the stromatolites, because they're early life form, an early life form that's going back over two billion years. And the stromatolite uh, is formed, uh, it's layered, actually. Stromos uh, from the Greek means layered, has a distinct layered aspect to it. Um, it developed from mucus secreting uh, microorganism, probably cy cyanobacteria. And this is a, a very, a, sort of a, a, a small exposure of one. And you can sort of see it has a, sort of small domes here, like you can follow it around there like that. Um, and they're, they're kind they're of vex upward. And that we can use for straight at the top, which would be off to the right. But these are really small compared to some of the large ones. This is a, uh, a large example of a stromatolite. Here's a, some place in here is my hammer. I guess that's it right there. Um, and this, is, this was a giant dome or column. Um, and and this is actually what is affectionately known as Big Daddy, because it's really one of the uh, largest of the stromatolite bodies in the, in the medicine boat. The stromatolites presently still exist, and, but they are found in very, very extreme uh, environments that are very highly saline and, and don't have very other animals. 
So during the uh, Proterozoic, stromatolites were the dominant life form, but there weren't very many critters to eat them. So uh, they, 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 they were very widespread. You have stromatolites in Death Valley. You have stromatolites in a lot of places. Uh, and, and they represent the dominant life form during the uh, uh, early uh, Proterozoic. Now, above the, the stromatolites is a little layer of basalt. Like I said, most of this is sedimentary, but there's a little layer of basalt. It's actually pillowed, uh, similar to that other one I showed you. Uh, and then you jump into a unit that is really quite, quite interesting because it's, it's a very fine grain uh, unit. Uh, it's now a slate or a phyllite, and it was mud, and it has little sand layers in it. It looks like uh, it was a very much of a deep water uh, deposit. The reason why that's interesting is the stromatolites are, are very shallow water, or relatively shallow water. So something happened uh, between the deposit, uh, development of the stromatolites, that little basalt flow that I mentioned, and the development of this deep water deposit. And that I'm going to get to that in a, in a few minutes. OK. okay so. Here's the Cheyenne Belt um, at, um, down at the south end of, of the Wyoming province. And like I said, you can trace it over to, uh, to near the uh, Uintas. Uh, when you get into the Wasatch, uh, there's other complex complexities there that don't really allow the Cheyenne Belt to go further. For that matter, the Wyoming province does it either. Um, so this is uh, where I said the Cheyenne Belt uh, should go, but it's uh, intruded by, uh, by various intrusions. And let's see. Okay. I just had to look and see where I was going there. Um, okay, south of the Cheyenne Belt are these rocks that were accreted on uh, to it. And like I said, there, there, there's big differences. One, these rocks are much younger. They're, uh, they're paleo proterozoic, they're about 179 or younger still. Also, they represent uh, volcanic arc deposits. Uh, and there are both uh, ancient volcanic, volcanic rocks there. And there's also large intrusive bodies that were probably the cores of uh, volcanoes that existed. So this map here, um, I hope it's sort of in focus, looks sort of a little funny here. Uh, is showing you the Cheyenne Belt. And the Cheyenne Belt varies a lot in, in thickness. Here, here it's about seven kilometers across, while over here it's a kilometer. So this, the Cheyenne Belt is what we call a geosuture. It's a, it's a fundamental boundary uh, in the Earth's crust, and it's bringing together the Wyoming province against the younger Colorado province. And once this boundary is formed, it affects uh, future tectonic uh, uh, episodes. It's, it's, a, it's a very uh, fundamental boundary. So there's, uh, there's some very nice uh, volcanic rocks that are preserved here. And this is uh, the Green Mountain Formation. Again, it's one of these tough uh, Lapilli tufts. This is a big fragment of Lapilli in a fine grain matrix. Now this is extremely deformed and, and flattened into strong foliation. But we can tell that this is a volcanic rock from this texture and also from the chemistry that's been done on it. Um, the Cheyenne Belt, per se, is characterized, it's a, it's a big fault, and it, it's characterized by ductile uh, fault rocks, which we refer to as myelinite. And they're strongly uh, foliated, strong fabric, and they're strongly delineated. And this was a rock that probably started its life as a granite, but now it's very, so strongly deformed it's hard to uh, recognize uh, exactly what it is. But uh, it probably was a granite, and now it's uh, a, a plastic uh, fault rock. Now, the idea about how the Paleoproterozoic uh, rocks were attached on to uh, the Wyoming province one place we can sort of look where something is happening in the modern that could be equivalent to the Paleoproterozoic is in the Southwest Pacific. 
And there, there are a number of arcs uh, that are available. This is the, the lob here, but the, this is the Java Trench in, in here, uh, New Hebrides. Uh, and these uh, arcs are going in different directions, and the red arrows indicate uh, which way the subduction zone is, is migrating. But some of these are headed toward Australia, uh, and eventually would collide with Australia. So in effect, Australia would be like a, a Wyoming province, and these various arcs would be attached on, would be uh, like the Colorado pro province. And so that being the case, you can develop some complex plate tectonic models. Now this was a model that was developed by one of my PhD graduate students. I'm not going to go through it step by step because it's really beyond what I um, wanted to accomplish in, in the lecture. But it, it, there's several different kinds of models. There's a lot of freedom in some of the, some, when you're dealing with such ancient rocks. But here is, a, here is an arc, the Green Mountain Arc, subduction zones dipping off to the south. Here's the rifted margin of, of the Wyoming province with the 10 kilometers of Paleo-Proterozoic rocks deposited on it, referred to as the Myogeum line there. Here's another situation where the, the, the subduction zone is, is, is dipping to the north. <coughs> now, both of these are, are permissible in, in the data we have. There's, uh, there's one that we prefer, but the base, but these are both permissible. Now, one thing in the, in the process that Dan Jones, who was my student, did, he did a lot of dating. He dated a lot of rocks with, with uranium lead uh, zircon dating. And, uh, he found out that the, the Green Mountain Arc is, a, is, is a 1.78 uh, billion years old. He also found that there was a major extensional event that happened at, at 1763 million. Um, and uh, that had to be incorporated into whatever model. And so here's, here's a, a couple of uh, ways to do it. Uh, one is uh, having a subduction zone to the north and developing a new arc here, and then having extension here in the back arc region. Or another way is having uh, this plate actually break off and mantle, mantle material coming up in here, underplating it. And the rocks that he dated were a combination of very basic rocks that were gabbros and uh, granitic rocks. Finally, eventually you have to uh, push all, all this together, and here's where the Cheyenne Belt develops, and Dan was able to date the, uh, the age of the Cheyenne Belt as 1750 MA. So this is the kind of models that you're dealing with when you're working with the Precambrian. Um, there's it's always multiple working hypotheses, but geochronology allows us to put some real time limits on things. And one thing we can say is the Cheyenne Belt uh, uh, formed uh, 30 million years after this arc. So there's a lot of history that was happening between the formation of these arcs and the final collision forming the Cheyenne Belt. Okay, um, so I, I've taken you through a lot. We've been focusing a lot on this geology uh, here in, in the, the Precambrian. There's one last little piece of it that I didn't talk about and it relates to those intrusions that are in the, the Laramie, Laramie uh, range that intrude into the Cheyenne Belt. And they are part of another big uh, process that went the, the length of North America. There was a magmatic period that was done between 1.3 and 1.5 uh, billion years ago. And it, 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 it was uh, from, from Labrador all the way to Southern California. It's very well developed here in, in the Rockies. And, and it comes up, it's, it's very abundant down here. It comes up, gets, just about gets to the Cheyenne Belt and some intrusions go across and they're, they're the only ones of that um, age uh, that intrude into the Wyoming province. That's why I said the Wyoming province, the Cheyenne Belt is a major boundary that affects uh, future uh, processes. So this is a, a map of the Laramie Range and, uh, that Ron, my friend Ron Frost uh, let me use. And it's showing you the complexity of, these, of intrusions. A lot of the intrusions are in orthosite, which is a very interesting rock because it's all plagioclase. 
And, um, and so you have to figure out how to take a magma, a basalt magma, and collect plagioclase. And um, the reason why anorthosite is particularly interesting in geologists is because most uh, lunar geologists believe that this, the highlands on the moon are anorthosite. And anorthosite was found on, I think it was a, a Apollo 14 is where they found, a, found some anorthosite. So this is a, a, um, an interesting intrusion in that it, it has a number of bodies of anorthosite in it. And, um, and there's not a very common rock on the face of the Earth. So this is what the anorthosite looks like. A lot of times it's layered. It's, it's gray. Sometimes it's iridescent. It's all, it consists of all plagioclase. And it, and it, and it had to be a, a mechanism that allowed this plagioclase to segregate from the magma to collect. And one way to do it is perhaps by floating the, the plagioclase respect to the denser, heavier minerals that are crystallizing out. Oops, hit the wrong button. Sorry. Okay. So we spent a lot of time talking about all this history here in the Precambrian and realized that Precambrian does take a, a lot of geologic time, so it's worth spending some time on it rather than going through it very rapidly. But then we have an interesting uh, problem. These rocks here date at 1.435. That's the age of the Laramie Anorthosite and the Sherman Granite. The next rocks that we see in the stratigraphic column are Flathead Sandstone, which is Middle Cambrian. Flathead Sandstone is the, the unit that's on top of Mount Moran. Um, and so there's like a billion years here that's missing. Uh, and it's sort of like if you had a, a book that was maybe 460 pages long, I'm using 460 because the age of Earth is about 4.6, and you pull 100 pages out of it. Um, we don't, this, this part of the story we don't know very well. Um, presumably, uh, there, was a lot, there was a long period of erosion. Uh, Wyoming was a highland. Uh, part of the reason for uh, thinking that is that there's basins to the south, the Uinta Basin, and basins to the north in Montana called the Belt Basin, and they appear to be, the sediments in there, at least in part, appear to be derived from the Wyoming province. But uh, it's, a, it's a long gap, and it's the longest gap all along here, and, and, and obviously um, it's where you have to guess exactly what's going on. Now there's a few other things that happen in here. Um, some uh, mafic dikes came in, and, and one of them is the mafic dikes that's on Moran, uh, face of Moran. That's approximately, and John can correct me on it, it's, I think it's around 1750. So it's in uh, the late Proterozoic, and it was indicate that some type of rifting going on, and that's why the normal faulting is, is there. Oops, remember to keep going. Okay, um, this is just to emphasize uh, how in, in geology, one line, one contact on a map can really indicate uh, a tremendous time span. This is in uh, Alcova Reservoir. Uh, John talked about the field trip uh, he was on uh, with several University of Wyoming professors plus lots of students. And uh, we went to this site and oops. Uh, we went to this site and these rocks up here are Upper Devonian uh, sedimentary rocks, or sandstones, and uh, they're about 350 million years old. This rock down here is Archean granite. It's part of the Wyoming province. It's one of the uh, uh, granites that I mentioned, about 2.6. So there's greater than this line right here, which is called an unconformity or a nonconformity, represents 2 billion years of history that's missing there. And uh, that always strikes me. That is really a great unconformity. <laughs> okay. Now um, let's let's just step back here in one, one minute. Um, what happens in the uh, early pa uh, Paleozoic? This period right here is we have a long history of sedimentation. 
Um, it begins with the flathead sandstone, and there's a whole number of units that are in here. I didn't bother to put them all on here. I picked out some that were particularly important. Um, but this is what we call a, uh, it was a cratonal platform, uh, and, uh, and there was uh, variations in sea level, went from shallow seas to sometimes uh, uh, actually uh, terrestrial environments. And, uh, and it built up a, a, a very distinctive stratigraphic column. So this is one of, the, one of the best places to see it is actually in uh, Wind River Canyon. Uh, and you drive, as you drive uh, from uh, the south end of Wind River Canyon north toward Thermopolis, you go through a whole stratigraphy uh, that represents that platform uh, sequence. And one of the units in there is a very uh, famous cliff former, the Madison Limestone. And it's where the best karst that we see in Wyoming is. Some of you may have been the Sinks Canyon, and the river there actually goes into a, a cave and is going into a, a place where there's been karst development, karstification. And then it comes out the other, the other side. So uh, the Madison Limestone, uh, a major limestone unit, and has undergone uh, karstification near its, near its top. Um, OK, let me explain this a little bit. Um, this is a diagram that, that's showing the um, thickness of the rocks that still exist right now in Wyoming. So the Madison Limestone is a Mississippian uh, unit. So it, on the zero side of it, there's no Madison Limestone, no Mississippian rocks. But you can see all out through here, there's uh, Mississippian rocks. In, in other words, the thickness would vary, but this is the zero line. And so the area was uh, covered by a shallow sea in Mississippi, and it, it, it uh, deposited Madison limestone or its equivalents. Another, and in, in contrast, though, you can sort of see that uh, there's no Silurian, or virtually no Silurian. Now, it doesn't mean there wasn't Silurian here at one time. And in fact, we have a feeling there was some, but now it, it's, it's all gone. Another unit that is very widely developed is the Pennsylvania uh, rocks. And I think that's Pennsylvania up there. Yeah, it's Pennsylvania. There's the zero line, and then the zero line's down here. So all of Wyoming was covered by Pennsylvania rocks uh, in the late Paleozoic. And one of the famous units uh, in Pennsylvania is the Ten Sleep uh, Sandstone in its type locality, Ten Sleep. There's other units that uh, have other names like the Minnelusa and the Quadra and the Weaver, and they're all about the same age. And the thing that's so distinctive about the Ten Sleep, at least one thing that's distinctive about it, is it has cross stratification, cross bends. And, and so during Pennsylvania time, Wyoming was covered by sand dunes. It was a sand sea uh, that existed there, and uh, the, the Ten Sleep is one example of, of the, the rocks that uh, were uh, forming these sand, sand dunes. OK, um, just a little word about the Permian, uh, because there's sort of an interesting story about the Permian. This is in Wind River Canyon, and this is a, a limestone here. The Permian is, a, is a, what we call a very complex unit as far as the stratigraphy. If you go over by Casper, same age Permian rocks here uh, look totally different. They're, they're red beds, and they have a few limestones in them, and they have gyps in them. If you go over um, in the western part of the state, in fact, down Snake River Canyon, um, uh, the Permian is, is, consists of black shales and shirts and phosphorite and a few limestones. So what that is, is an example of what we call a facies change, where you can go from very different environments. All, it's all happening at the same time. You're going from a coastal environment, where there was actually probably evaporites and slopkas, over to a much deeper water environment, where cold, nutrient-rich waters are, are coming up the slope and forming the phosphorite. So, so when you're dealing with stratigraphy, um, it's not just layer cake stratigraphy. There's all kinds of uh, inner layers. And by figuring out that, you can develop a very good feeling for what the depositional environments were like. 
Okay, uh, in Triassic time, um, right up here, things sort of are, are quite a bit different and, and, uh, and look, uh, look different. Um, so at that time, um, this is one of Ron Blakey's uh, paleogeographic maps, which turned out to be extraordinarily useful. Uh, so this is Middle Triassic. Wyoming was on the edge of a, a marine basin here, but it was very near the equator. And the rocks that, that were deposited at that time are characterized the red beds. And so it was uh, an oxidizing environment. It was probably humid. Uh, and it, it, there wasn't a lot of life around. It wasn't a very hospitable place. In fact, uh, there's very few fossils found uh, in these red beds. Okay, so this is a uh, Red Canyon uh, uh, along uh, 28, I think that's 28 uh, there, as you're on the east side, uh, northeast side of the, the Wind Rivers. And the rocks that you're seeing here are red beds with interlayered sandstones, and it's called the Red Peak Formation. Then there's a thin little limestone we'll talk about in just a minute that's right up here called the Alcova limestone. Then above here uh, are upper Triassic rocks, uh, including some fluvial deposits. All this is called the Chugwater Group. Now a lot of times you just you don't see all these units. A lot of times you just see the red bits. And one of the most distinctive units in all of Wyoming is the Chugwater. It's red and it represents these Triassic rocks. Uh, that were forming in a mud flat, humid environment, uh, oxidizing condition, and not a particularly a lot of life form around. Now, this thin little limestone I talked about called the Alcova limestone is, is fun to look at because it's stromatolites again. And uh, these stromatolites uh, probably are more algal than cyanobacterial. And uh, the unit is uh, only a about four to five meters thick, so it's not a particularly thick unit. And it's one of the best uh, marker horizons uh, in Wyoming. And so a person like myself who does structural geology, you like to know what unit you're in, and, and you can't mix up the, the Alcoba limestone is so distinctive, and it's usually a ridge former, uh, that it's extremely helpful in trying to work out the structure of the area. Okay, in Jurassic time, we're moving sort of through the stratigraphic column here. This is the first time that we actually had the beginnings of an inland sea, uh, the Sundance uh, Sea. And so um, this, again, Wyoming, here's the equator down here. Uh, Wyoming's moved further north, but it's adjacent to uh, an inland sea, and in part covered by an inland sea. So uh, the evidence for that are, are fossil, fossiliferous limestones uh, that make up the Sundance formation. A variety of things are in the Sundance, but this is an example. Here's a series of uh, brachiopod uh, shells uh, that are uh, in, the, in the Sundance. And uh, there's also dolomites in here, too. So this was when we actually had the beginnings of an inland sea. However, um, that sea uh, disappeared because uh, above the Sundance is the Morrison Formation, which is characterized by the dinosaur bones. And so it went back to a terrestrial environment. In late Cretaceous time, though, the sea, sea again was formed. And this, this time, this time, um, the uh, sea went from the Arctic down to the Gulf of Mexico. And on the margins, of that sea was a fold and thrust belt. Uh, and what's happened was happening was that fold and thrust belt was loading uh, the continental crust or the uh, of the or continental lithosphere and and developing uh, a lot of accommodation space here where lots of sediments could be deposited. And so if you look at we talked a lot of, about the Paleozoic stratigraphy that was down here where the Mississippi limestones and Permian were and also the uh, chugwater. But those units are really very thin compared to once you get into the uh, late uh, Cretaceous where you have that foreland basin developing. And you get thousands of feet of sediments in here uh, that are forming in a, in a foreland basin. 
and uh, as the thrust belt is loading uh, the, the lithosphere. So this is the thrust belt here on the west, southwest side of Wyoming. And these are um, isopack maps uh, in meters showing you the thickness of the stratigraphy. And in places, uh, it gets up to uh, over 15,000 feet in, in, in thickness. While out here, on this area here, it's more about three or 4,000 feet as far as the Foreland Basin deposits. Okay, so um, the thrust belt is probably uh, a Wyoming, Idaho, and Utah is probably one of the best known thrust belts on the face of the earth. Uh, there, one of the reasons is, is, in fact, the main reason is because of, uh, of oil and gas exploration. Also, there was also uh, exploration for phosphorite because phosphate is, is a fundamental in fertilizers. And they, uh, the USGS started that uh, uh, a long time ago. But the, the, the thrust belt's been mapped in detail. There's lots of seismic across it. Um, and uh, in a nutshell, the oldest thrusts are in the west. It gets progressively younger uh, toward the east. Um, there is, uh, it lasts about uh, 70 million years. The thrust belt began about 120 million years ago and lasted until about 50 million. Up here uh, near um, Jackson, the thrust belt is interacting with uh, Laramide uplift, the Grovot, Teton, Laramide uh, basement involved uplift. Um, if you look at this diagram, the thrust belt is, it lasts longer than the Laramide uh, orogeny, um, but it overlaps it. They're both going on at the same time. So here's a place I think you all know. This is uh, along the Hoback River, and here is the, uh, the uh, Triassic, Jurassic, or Jurassic, Triassic uh, nugget formation sitting on vertebrate paleo, vertebrate bearing uh, Hoback, uh, Paleocene Hoback formation. And so this is near the front of the thrust belt, uh, and it's part of what's called the, it's called the Cliff Creek Thrust, but it's part of the prospect system. And <coughs> you're putting older rocks here on top of younger rocks. So we're by Cokeville. Um, my wife and I drove up uh, through uh, Star Valley. We didn't go to Cokeville, but it's uh, this is a famous uh, uh, outcrop that we take our students to because it's a nice example of, of a ramp anticline in the fault trust belt. These rocks right here are, are ten sleep, or ten the equivalent to ten sleep in the fault trust belt. Okay. Uh, the good question might be, why did the folded thrust belt uh, actually develop? What, what's the reason? Because this represents a lot of crustal shortening here over 70 million years. And, um, and where, did, where can we go to look at it? Well, one place we can look is out in uh, what's called the hinterland. In other words, behind the thrust belt. By the way, I might emphasize that the thrust belt right here in, in Idaho, Wyoming, and Utah can be traced down uh, to Las Vegas uh, in this area here. Some version of it goes into southern Arizona and eventually into Mexico. And they can also be traced up into Montana into the Canadian Rockies. So this is a fundamental tectonic zone uh, that affected the whole, whole continent. And um, so one place to maybe look is, is in the hinterland, the roots of the thrust belt, to see what we find there. And so this is a diagram, a cartoon diagram, sort of uh, contrasting the thrust belt, which is dominantly thin-skinned, not totally thin-skinned because you get Precambrian rocks in the Wasatch, but I didn't put it into this cross-section. Here's, here's one of the Laramide uplifts uh, involving basement rocks. So these have very t two very different decoupling zones, one high in the, uh, the sedimentary section until it gets to the Wasatch and one down here in the basement. And in the hinterland, there's lots of evidence of Cretaceous and early tertiary magnetism and plastic deformation. And that could be part of the plunger that uh, pushed the thrust belt. And so in those areas, you see structures like this, 
This is a large scale fold. This is uh, a, a rocks that are equivalent to the flathead sandstone. They're called the Prospect Mountain Quartzite. It's folded into a gigantic fold. Um, and, um, and then the, these rocks plus all the adjacent rocks here are full of granite. So this has undergone plastic deformation, uh, lots of flow, and uh, flow to the east would allow to act as a plunger to shorten the thrust belt. <coughs> okay, the, I talked about the Laramide a couple times. I talked about it, that it uh, is a basement involved. Uh, that's uh, why the, uh, we have such good exposures of the Precambrian. The Laramide, you can trace it from up here in southwest Montana down to uh, New Mexico. Uh, but the classic area for the Laramide is right here in Wyoming. Uh, Laramide is, is, is a thick skin uh, uh, type uh, orogenic belt because it involves uh, basement rocks. It doesn't have the amount of shortening that the, the thrust belt has, but uh, it forms spectacular structures uh, like uh, the, the Bighorns or the uh, Wind Rivers. <coughs> this is a, a cross section uh, that's uh, through uh, the Casper Arch. And, um, and it's been developed through uh, drilling and seismic. There's not a lot, oops. Yeah. I'm not going to hit that when I want to hit this. Uh, there's not a lot at the surface to tell you the complexity of this. And this well drilled through about 5,000 feet of granite, so that was pretty brave. And, <laughs> and it, it ended up in, into Cretaceous, and there was, I think, some production from it. But the point I really wanted to make is that this is one of these big thrust faults that is uh, going down. These can be traced. There's a lot of new work that's got done with geophysics and the big horns, and these can be traced down uh, into the deep crust. This is a, uh, one of the, the Laramide thrusts that's very well exposed west of Buffalo. They're called the Clear Creek uh, thrust. Um, these are sub-vertical Paleozoic rocks uh, here, lower Paleozoic rocks, and then up the road a ways are Precambrian granites. And so this is a thrust that's putting these sub-vertical Paleozoic and Precambrian granites on top of uh, dipping uh, Eocene conglomerates. So there's lots of stratigraphic separation here, and it's a, it's a big fault. This is an interesting Laramide uh, anticline that my students and I mapped, so I, I sort of like showing this. Um, you can see it's plunging off here, it's to the north. This is this is ten sleep um, sandstone in here. These rocks here are, are the goose egg, uh, which are these Permian rocks that contain gypsum and limestones and red beds. There's a fault that's right right down through here, comes across like this and then sort of sneaks on through here. This, what's happened is that this fold, which is clearly plunging off this way, what happens is it goes vertical here, and this is the same fold, but it's plunging vertically. And, and then uh, all these rocks out in here are vertical. Now, th this is a, an example of the complexity in the Laramide, because this is a relatively small s structure at the surface. But in the subsurface is a very large fault, a very large fault, and it's actually you're seeing polyphase deformation of this uh, laramide structure because of movement along that line line thrust. So the laramide is not just simple; it's it's got some real complexities to it itself. Okay, the next series of, of maps are going to be paleogeographic maps um, that uh, a friend of mine, uh, Jay Lowgraven and Larry Ostrich, put together. And it will show us how landscape was developing uh, in the in the uh, Cretaceous, the late, starting at the latest Cretaceous. So over here on the right side, left side, excuse me, left side is the flowing thrust belt, and then here's some it, the beginnings of some Laramide uplifts. And so Jackson is right about there. So we move a little bit into the Cretaceous, and the, the uplifts are starting to develop. Now we're getting uh, more uh, into the uh, we're into the tertiary here, uh, the Paleocene, 
The thrust belt's still active uh, and it's developing here. The uplifts are, are, are uh, this would be the Wind Rivers, this would be the uh, Granite Mountains, this would be um, the uh, Laramie Range. Uh, here is a combination of, of Grovance and Teton and Palermite uplifts. There's a lake up here in the Powder River Basin. And then uh, further along, getting uh, sort of toward the end of the activity, we have a full-blown um, Laramide uplifts, basement involved, a well-developed thrust belt. Now, moving in sort of toward the end, we're starting to see some erosion of both the thrust belt and the, uh, and the uh, uh, Laramide uplifts. And then finally here, this is pretty much at the end. Uh, at that time, uh, we have a large uh, lakes, uh, Fossil Lake, and then this would be Lake Goshu. And um, one of the most famous uh, lakes in the world has been highly studied. Uh, it's it's, it's um, a place where there's unbelievable uh, fauna. Uh, there are crocodiles, there are gars, uh, flamingo rookeries, snakes, turtles. Um, it's uh, a spectacular fish of various sorts. It's a spectacular place to look at ancient lake deposits. So this is uh, some useful paleogeographic maps to sort of show. So here are the lakes here in southwestern uh, of Wyoming. And then magnetism starts kicking in. Now, we haven't talked about magnetism at all. Uh, uh, we talked about it a lot in the Precambrian, but in the, in the Paleozoic and into the Mesozoic and now into the Tertiary, this is the first time where magnetism plays a big role in uh, Wyoming geology. And so what's happening here is this is the buildup of the, of the Absarca uh, volcanic pile that is uh, in the middle Eocene. So while that is building up, the lakes still exist. So at that time, Wyoming well, would be a pretty exciting place. Uh, we'd have these lakes with crocodiles floating around in it, and then have a, a volcanic uh, mountain range developing with uh, volcanoes that are uh, in excess of uh, 10,000 feet. Okay. So that is, let me see, here we go. Find the right spot here. So here. Here, here's the absorbed of volcanism in here, and at, and that it ends somewhere in the 40s, uh, about oh about well about 38 million where it ends, and then after that there is is widespread erosion, and and this is a period where uh, a lot where a lot of uh, the uplifts are being eroded, and what's happening is lots of sedimentation is, uh, is uh, collecting in the basins. And so the Laramide uh, uplifts are essentially being covered up by, by sediments. And this will continue through the uh, late Eocene, the Oligocene, into the Miocene, so that if you looked at it, I don't have it here, but if you looked at a Miocene map, there would just be very little uh, bits of, of the highest part of the um, the Laramide uplifts preserved while the rest would be a, a featureless plain. Now the reason that's sort of important is that, oops, let's go back. Uh, the reason that's important is that um, all this is going to be uh, exhumed in late Cenozoic time and then the, the Laramide skeleton would be then exposed again. But at this, at this time and into the, into the Miocene, uh, you can sort of see it, it's uh, rivers can develop, courses can go wherever they want because uh, there's not much in the way of mountains to, uh, to uh, impede them. So at the time that, um, that this uh, uh, erosion and also aggregation is, is going on, um, there's lots of volcanisms going out in, in the uh, Great Basin. And a lot of that ash is carried uh, to, the, to the east. And so here in Bates Hole, we're looking at tertiary rocks. And these white beds here are called the White River Formation. Uh, the rocks above are the Rickery. 
And we're seeing um, well-preserved volcanic ash uh, in uh, these units. And so Wyoming was covered by these rocks. Um, uh, and in the Miocene, uh, like I said, rivers can go a variety of different directions. But then during late Cenozoic uplift or a combination of late Cenozoic uplift and climate change, um, the rivers cut down and they found their, they were in their courses, they were uh, trapped. And so you get all kinds of superposed uh, deposition, I mean superposed uh, uh, drainage. And uh, so this is Devil's Gate, uh, where the Sweetwater River cuts right through a, a granite mass. Uh, Wind River cuts across the Owl Creeks. The Bighorn River cuts across the northern end of, of the Bighorns. The Laramie River cuts across Laramie. All those rivers were developed in Miocene time when uh, it, there was the area was covered by uh, these volcanic ashes and associated sediments. Okay, moving uh, into a younger time, um, 17 million is when the basin of range is starting to form. Uh, also, it's the same time, looking at this in a more continental uh, framework, it's the same time the Columbia River uh, basalts are going on. <coughs> Okay, now um, we're getting to, uh, into the uh, late Miocene um, and, into, and into the Pliocene. Um, and this is when uh, the, the hot spot is going to be coming down along, uh, coming up along the Snake River Plain. And just move on a little bit further. So here's a series of calderas, and I, I think all of you are pretty familiar with this, so I'm not going to spend a long time on this. but, but uh, this is where a series of calderas uh, developed from 16 million here in, in north central um, or north northern uh, Nevada, and of course ending up here at Yellowstone with three major eruptions at 2.1, 1.2, and 660,000 years ago, and coming up to to Yellowstone with its uh, three major eruptions. Uh, the 2.1 that Caldera outlined here, Mesa, Mesa Falls outlined here in, uh, to, the, to the southwest, and then the present Yellowstone Caldera uh, outlined here in, in purple. Oops, sorry. Um, these are gigantic eruptions. Uh, ash uh, uh, covered lots of the United States. Um, the, uh, the largest of these was, was the uh, Huckleberry uh, Ridge uh, uh, eruption, uh, and you can see uh, here the uh, the um, boundaries of it. Let me make sure I can see it. Uh, right here, the dotted patterns. Uh, Mesa Falls was uh, not as big, but uh, still uh, big compared to things like Mount St. Helens, and then Lava Creek <coughs> spread out actually further than. Um, in Huckleberry Ridge, but volume-wise, Huckleberry Ridge is still uh, the largest. So here's a uh, some a cartoon showing the various different uh, from the USGS showing the various different uh, sizes of the eruptions. And here's Huckleberry Ridge. Uh, here's uh, Mesa Falls, and then over here is uh, the Yellowstone uh, uh, Yellowstone Tufts. Here's, you can see, compared to modern eruptions, these are giant, giant eruptions. Finally, just a word about seismicity. I don't think I need to say too much here. You're all familiar that the most seismic part of the state is over in western Wyoming related to the Intermountain Seismic Zone and then volcanic activity around Yellowstone. If you look at earthquakes in the rest of the part of the state, they really don't show much of a pattern and they're very, very scattered. So the seismogenic zone is definitely over here in the northwest side. And that's the end. Thank you. We have time for a few questions for Art, if anybody has any. Yes. So under uh, time scale,
Yeah. Yeah, I can expand on that. Yeah. Okay, the question was on the time scale, I had ancestral Rocky Mountains, and how could I expand on it? And I can. I, there was a reason why I, I was worried I wasn't going to finish uh, on time, so that's why I cut it out. But in the, in the late Paleozoic, uh, there was a major uh, continent continent collision. Uh, in the southern part of the United States, where the present-day Wachita Mountains are. That continent cotton collision caused uh, uh, stresses were uh, sent out to the, to, the, uh, to the north, and in Colorado there were major uplifts, basin-involved uplifts that are very much like Laramide, and they formed large basins and they uh, caused uplifts uh, exposing Precambrian rocks. Those, the, rock, the ancestral Rockies barely make it in to Wyoming. They, they seem to stop at around the Cheyenne Belt. But if you're in southeastern Wyoming, what happens is that Pennsylvania rocks, like uh, the Fountain Formation, are deposited directly on, on, on basement rocks, and the rest of the particularly has been eroded away. So the ancestral Rockies are important, particularly in Colorado. They're less important in Wyoming, but there is good evidence of the ancestral Rockies in, in Wyoming. Can you talk a little bit about the Tetons in terms of how old they are and when, how they got there? <laughs> well, I, I talked a little bit about the Tetons in, 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 uh, in passing. Um, well, the, the Teton, the, the history and the detailed uh, Teton history is in the Precambrian rocks. And um, so, and then, but they were also part of the Laramide uplift. So there's there's several parts to this question. Um, the units in the Tetons, and I I'm, I'm probably going to forget some of them. We have to apologize on. There's some very very old gneisses there, uh, and uh, and also there's supercrustal rocks. There there's the Mount Owen uh, quartz monzonite, which is one of these uh, uh, Archean granites. And then there's mafic rocks uh, called the rendezvous uh, gabbro. So there's all the elements of the of the uh, Wyoming uh, province are in the Tetons uh, and, and, and available. Ron Frost and Carol Frost have been studying the Tetons for quite a bit. That I have never actually I've been here as a visitor, not as a as a working on a project. But they feel the Tetons represent a one of the earliest. Uh, continental, continental, or microcontinental, microcontinental collisions, a, a Himalayan type uh, type collision, and it's based on some very high grade metamorphic rocks they see there that they thought the crust has to be thickened. So if that's true, that would that would be the earliest Himalayan type collision that is uh, known on on Earth. Now the other parts of the Teton story has to do with the the Laramide in the sense that the Grovant and Tetons were all part of a block, and there's a major thrust called the Cache Creek Thrust that brought up the Grovants and, and the uh, Tetons during uh, Laramide time. And then, of course, it was overprinted by basin range faulting and tilted it back to, back to the uh, west. I don't know if that answers your question, but there's, there's, the Tetons have a long history. I mean, you have a complicated Precambrian history, you have a Laramide history, and then you have a tertiary history. But I've always heard that the Tetons were the youngest mountain range. Yeah, it's the youngest mountain range in the sense of its of its present form, uh, but it contains some very very old rocks, and you can trace a history that goes all the way back to uh, deep into the Archean. Questions for art? If not, well, there's one. You mentioned the equator moving. The equator's not moving. Wyoming's moving. Okay. <laughs> yeah, if I said the equator is moving, it's it's relative. Uh, Wyoming is moving. It's in, in Triassic time, it's nearer the equator. By Jurassic time, it's quite a bit farther away. Good question. I'm not sure everybody can hear that. She said, how long did it take the Tetons to rise where they are? Well, there was, there was probably two stages here. There was a Laramide uplift that I talked about, the 
combination of the Grovons and the Tetons. And then the Teton Fault, well that depends on how old you think the Teton Fault is. And probably it's in the last two million years. Is that about right? That's the best guess. John Tyson and others believe it's mostly in the last two million years. But there was an earlier history of it too in the Laramie. Maria, I'm not Maria, it's my favorite. Uh, Tons. And I've always thought, because it's kind of flat on top, once upon a time, it went up higher than the Grand, and something happened to the top third. Would that be a possibility? <laughs> well, I, I don't know the answer to that one. Uh, but at, at one stage, the top of the Tetons were sea level, uh, because you had the Flathead Sandstone sitting there, and that was a marine sandstone in Cambrian times. Now it's up. Um, over what 10,000 feet on Mount Moran, so um, I don't know. I, I I don't think I can answer the question if it went greater than the Grand. Okay, thank you. If there aren't any other questions, a couple of things. Then um, first, we have a wow, wow something. For you to remember us by Martin's <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'd certainly like to, to thank Art for that. And as we do that, a couple of things. In two weeks' time, uh, we're going to have a completely different type of presentation. Uh, it's going to be about uh, North American megafauna and their extinction. Um, over the last, what, uh, 10, 100,000 years, Mike? All the extinctions, well, it's 10,000 years ago. Yeah, it's people, people witnessed it. So, um, <laughs> not us, nobody. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so that's uh, Doug Bradstreet and Mike Scherr will talk about that in two weeks' time. And uh, Doug, I'm sure, will have some fossils to, to show everybody. Um, then we get into, well, let's see, uh, in the day after that, we'll have one of our lunchtime programs, and Dave Adams will talk about seismic tomography, you know, which is basically how we look inside the earth and, and see what we see. So mm -hmm. that one will be pretty interesting as well. Um, other things, if when you get up, if you would be so kind as people on this side to move the chairs over here, stack them against that wall, and on this side, stack them over by the curtains, if you appreciate it. And then finally, I'd just like to ask you to join me in thanking Art Snow.